Today we're going to move on from the world of pure geometry. Things start in space as we understand it without any coordinates. And it's a very elegant world. And the only shortcoming is that to solve any problem, you have to come up with some ingenious approach. And every problem is unique, relatively. And uh, the scope is not as great as if you start introducing some uh, other methods from another realm. And of course, that realm is algebra. And it's when coordinate systems are introduced is when algebra and geometry really come together. So we're not quite there yet. Today we'll just begin to inject a little bit of algebra into our world. And you will see that even with that little bit of algebra, and it will all be in the form of geometric vectors, uh, we will broaden the scope of problems that we can do. And not only do if we were Archimedes, but really do uh, rather easily. And there were a couple homework problems that were very challenging to do by classical Greek geometry methods. And they will be a joke when you start using a little bit of algebra with geometric vectors. So today is just a survey lecture on what a vector is. So again, this will be an exercise in finding common ground and getting on the same page. So that's the goal for today. So there are two concepts that I want to establish, and that's the concept of a vector and the concept of a dot product, the dot product. And hopefully there will be benefit not just to this course, but to some other courses you're taking or will take in the future. There are many disciplines that use the word vector and use it in very related but different senses. So today I just want to establish the three different senses in which the terms uh, vectors and inner slash dot products are used, how we're going to use it, and just compare how other subjects use it. So there will be three different approaches. The one that we'll take, we'll, I'll dedicate this half of the board to. And the two other approaches will split this board. And I start in different places depending on what topic I'm talking about. And you'll do the same thing. In one class, vector means one thing. In another class, vector means another thing. The concepts are not contradictory. It's just a question of where do you start and what's a corollary. And in another approach, what is a corollary in, one, in the original approach becomes the definition. And what used to be the definition in one approach becomes a corollary in another approach. So let's just sort things out a little bit. So when you hear the word vector, what comes to mind? I'm hoping for three different answers. An arrow in space, that's certainly one. Yes? Column or row vector, that's another. You already nailed two out of three. Yeah, that's right. So that's the linear algebra approach. That's probably the most abstract and theoretical approach. Okay, so three different definitions of the vector. So let's start with the one that will be central to us, and that is a directed segment. Whoops, oh, I'm off my game today. A directed segment, that's one approach. Another approach is the linear algebra approach. Linear algebra is a subject that strives to be as broad as possible. And it wants to say something useful about objects that are as diverse and as different as possible. So it makes the definition least demanding. It just says a vector is any type of object that can be added together to produce another object of the same kind or multiplied by a number, for our purposes, real number, and produce another object of the same kind. So I can't give you a specific example because of course I can, but there are many different equally valid specific examples. So I don't want to give a specific example just yet. But it just tells you what you can do with objects. Add them together and multiply by a number to produce another object of the same kind. And of course, there's more to it. These operations need to have certain properties. For example, it needs to be symmetric. The, uh, excuse me, addition needs to be commutative. The combination of addition and multiplication needs to be distributive, and all of that. So there are some details to be filled. And then the third example is, I'll just call it Rn. They'll say a column or a row. In other words, an element of Rn. Okay, 
So this definition is the most general. According to this definition, a great variety of things can be considered vectors. There's actually an additional level of subtlety here, which is what this definition really gives us is the concept of a vector space. And then a vector is an element of, the, of a vector space. And of course, geometric vectors can be an example of linear algebra vectors. Elements of Rn are certainly examples of linear algebra vectors. So that's how math sometimes works. It What's a definition in one area becomes a consequence in another. Okay. So that's our definition of a vector. So, like I said, Rn is an example, and geometric vectors are an example. But we should focus in this more advanced class on the details. And it's the properties that need to be satisfied in order for objects to actually be considered vectors, or in order for the totality of objects to be considered vector space. And that's, of course, I'm not necessarily trying to list all of them. But one of them is commutativity. Do vectors in Rn satisfy commutativity? I think it's pretty clear that they do, because numbers satisfy commutativity. And these are just sets of numbers. And then when you do it entry by entry, you add them as numbers. So yeah, I think commutativity would be quite simple. Do these vectors satisfy commutativity? Do these objects? satisfy the commutative property and therefore qualify as vectors? Well, that's not such a simple question, actually. So that's where the hard work needs to take place. And I haven't even defined how we would add these vectors, but the rule is, of course, tip to tail. And when I studied linear algebra and these types of objects, the rule was called the parallelogram rule, which is equivalent. Let's try for completeness and just define what it means to add two vectors. And to be a little bit more specific, when we talk about geometric vectors, we will always pick an arbitrary point, but just one, that's called the origin. And all the geometric vectors will emanate from that point. And if you find a vector somewhere else, because some additional construction made it more convenient to have the vector elsewhere, you have to imagine it as being brought back in parallel fashion and coming out of this point. And that's just to narrow the objects that we're looking at. We don't want to talk about vector fields until later. Right now we're just talking about one linear space of vectors. So that's our objects. And to add two objects, you have to do exactly what I just said. Two objects of this kind. You have to take one of them and translate it in parallel fashion to the tip of the other. If this is u, I'll put a little arrow over it, meaning geometric vector, and this is v. Then you just conveniently bring v over here. And you connect the origin to the tip of v, and that is u plus v. And there it is. I'll write it right here, u. Now I at least defined addition. Just a quick commentary. This could almost equivalently, bless you, be stated as a parallel as the parallelogram rule. Because, because if you have a vector u and a vector v, another approach is to complete it to a parallelogram by drawing lines parallel to the other vector through the tip of each vector. And wherever those lines intersect, lines intersect, that's the tip of their sum. So there's something quite attractive about stating the rule this way, and that is, number one, the two vectors are treated equally. Right here, u stays put and v moves. Alternatively, you could move u and v would stay put, and uh, that would be equivalent, but still, u and v are unequal. And here, u and v are completely equal. And here, we also, in a way, stayed more true to the notion that all vectors come from this point. So not at any time did the vectors leave the origin. They're all anchored there. So that's what makes it so attractive, and that's why I think a lot of books uh, emphasize this approach. But it has a flaw, and the flaw is that the parallelogram rule doesn't work when the two vectors are collinear. 
For example, if one vector is like this, and another vector points along the same line, maybe the same direction or opposite direction, then when you try to do the parallelogram rule, the two lines won't intersect at a single point. It, one line would look like this, and the other line would look like that also. And so the parallelogram rule doesn't work, but the tip-to-tail rule works without a, without a problem. You just take this vector, you bring it to the tip of the other, and there's their sum right there, where this is the origin. So the tip-to-tail approach is just a little bit more robust. The same is true when the vectors are not necessarily collinear, but one of them is zero, or both are zero. In fact, this approach only works when the vectors are linearly independent. And when they're linearly dependent, this approach breaks down. So tip-to-tail is more universal. It continues to work. It's more robust. That's why I've switched to tip-to-tail. Uh, as a, uh, let's say, mathematician, it's hard for me to give up symmetry, but I've given up symmetry in favor of robustness. Okay, so that's what it means to add two vectors. For completeness, I should also define what it means to multiply a vector by a number, and that is simple. So if this is the ve vector u, then 2u is a vector also starts at the origin, as all vectors do points in the same direction and is twice as long. So you basically scale the magnitude of the vector by the factor that the number you're multiplying by. And if the number is negative, for example, this will be minus 2u, you change the sense. You can say the direction. It's nice to distinguish between direction and sense. Direction means what direction you're pointing in, and it can be in any direction. And sense narrows it down between this and the opposite direction. So it's a convenient word. I don't want to say that it changes its direction because the direction is a straight line. That's a nice convention. So it changes its sense to the opposite sense. And when you multiply it by zero, it becomes the zero vector. Okay? So I have defined what it means to add these vectors, geometric vectors and what it means to multiply them by numbers, which makes them very much candidates for the general linear algebra definition of what a vector is. That's good. But let's not forget about the properties, right? That is, the operation that we defined must also satisfy these properties. And does it? And what would it even mean? We would have to think about it. Um, so before we think about commutativity, we should think about even internal consistency. So with tip to tail, you can do it in one of two ways. You can bring V to the tip of U, or you can bring U to the tip of V. Would you get the same result in both cases? Well, that's something that you would have to prove geometrically, which is what our starting point is. So in linear algebra, this becomes an axiom. This becomes a definition. You can, when you're doing theoretical work, you can assume that this is true because that's part of the definition. And when presented with another type of object, well, you have to make sure, does it satisfy this definition and therefore constitute a vector space or not? Which is the work that we need to do here. And here, we have to do it geometrically. So that will be uh, one of the homework assignment, uh, one of the problems on the homework assignment where you confirm by drawing uh, diagrams and using geometry that, first of all, this definition is internally consistent, that whether you do one or the other, you get the same vector. And I think in this case, that actually means that it would be uh, commutative as well, uh, because then the definition is the same for whether you do u plus v or v plus u, no difference. The same, the same construction, you just have to make sure that it's internally consistent. Okay, so that's one axiom. Another axiom has to do with uh, the distributive property. I think there are several. Okay, you would have to make sure that that is true. This is so natural, you never think about it in linear algebra because it's the very basis of everything. But for us to comfortably use methods of linear algebra, we have to make sure that's true. I believe, so I'm not an axiom guy. I can easily miss one or add an extra one, but I'll bet you this is one of them. 
that it distributes this way as well. So you see it distributes on both the vector sum and the scalar sum. I remember there being more. I think that there's probably a rule like this, that if you multiply u by beta and then by alpha, it's the same as multiplying it by alpha beta. I'll bet you there's a rule like that. And because the ordinary product of numbers is commutative, we can switch them here and go backwards. And so conclude that beta times alpha u equals alpha times beta u. So that's another, can I call it a distributive property? There's probably a name for what this is. We should look it up for completeness. I'll bet you there are other axioms that make the definition complete. I'm going to guess one more, two more, that the number zero times any vector is the zero vector. That's probably in the mix, that the zero vector times any number equals the zero vector. And I wonder if you also have to throw in the fact that if you take the number one and multiply it by a vector, so slight correction in style, we will reserve the arrow for geometric vectors, which is good because that's the primary focus of our study. So here to indicate vectors, we're just gonna make the symbol bold. So not the letters, but just zero where it's ambiguous. So the number zero times any vector is the zero vector. And now the zero vector times any number alpha is the zero vector. Okay. And the number one times any vector u is that same vector u. And maybe this is one too many. Maybe it's not part of the standard mix. Maybe I'm missing a couple. Right? This is not so important, except to know that this is an axiomatic approach. Linear algebra is the most abstract of them all, of all the approaches. And it's very easy with Rn to make sure that all of these properties are satisfied and therefore elements of Rn. So Rn is a vector space and therefore elements of Rn, like this, uh, is a proper vector and so on. Okay? With geometric vectors, a couple of these, you'll be like, huh, I wonder what I should draw. I think this one will be the most involved. But before you make sure that these axioms are satisfied, you can't really use methods of linear algebra and apply them here and talk about linear independence, basis, and all of that. Okay, so this is our definition. And you'll have to do the work to prove that these axioms are satisfied in order for us to freely use vectors. I'll give you one application today just to whet your appetite, but you will see that we're missing one very, very important ingredient. Of course, it's the dot product. And what's so interesting is that even without the dot product, you can do a lot of the problems from the past homeworks that were very challenging geometrically, okay? But let's throw in the dot product.